Good afternoon, welcome to UK Column News. Hopefully we'll be able to stay on air today. Um, sorry about yesterday, but today is the 20th of August 2014 and it's just gone one o'clock. Myself, Brian Gerrish, Ryan Bro um, Mike Robinson and myself, Louise Collins. I did it again, didn't I? I've been out the swing of things. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's been a tricky week to get started, but uh, anyway, it should, should, should be OK should today. Do. We'll see what happens. So, our guest. Yes, Guy Taylor is on the line with an update of what's been happening at Bodnam Manor. So, uh, I think we'll bring him straight in. Guy, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Lou. How are you doing? Yeah, very well, yeah. We're, uh, we're all at Bodnam Manor. Um, we... Um, obviously, I mean, if people know or make themselves aware that it's all to do with a, a fraudulent loan uh, involving Barclays Bank uh, originally, um, which I didn't take out. Um, and that was used to remove, uh, ultimately used to remove myself and all our tenants of uh, up to 30 years uh, in the property. And they used a fake writ to do so. So we've had all this going on. And in the meantime, uh, they got the bailiffs then to seize the property and hold it. Well, I learned that they were ready to sell the property. So I contacted all the parties and said, well, you know, how can you sell stolen property? You know, I've got no engagement with this process. And so anyway, ultimately, to cut a long story short, uh, they believed they sold the property to somebody. Well, of course, as I know, you can't sell stolen property. It always goes back and is restored to the, to the owner. So, um, the public being made aware of this, because we were fully transparent and, you know, in all our activities, um, I called upon uh, members of the public to assist me and act as witnesses uh, to an event. And on Saturday, myself and probably between 40 and 50 people came to the manor to uh, repossess it. And that's exactly what we did. Um, the police had somehow got wind of this and were at the front gate, but we came up through the back gate and repossessed the property and we're all currently in the property, um, people are getting wonderful support from the public. We've got a full-time guard at the gate with two police cars on the one gate. On the other gate, we've now got another police car, and we've got a helicopter which flies very, very low uh, for uh, 20 minutes, perhaps two or three times a day, over the property. I've been communicating with the police about explaining to them about the fraudulent document situation. Um, but this is all the new day, really, because, you know, we've possess this build, repossess this building, this building is ours, our family own it, we've got all the deeds. And obviously if, if I've sold it, then I'd like to see something with my signature on, or you know, exchange of contracts, or completion and sale, or payment, or exchange of money, or a transfer form, or something from the land registry, nothing at all. So um, we've not, you know, sort of, we, family owned our property for 30 years, uh, get, literally get it seized off them uh, without no notice, we're not even we weren't even informed so we're back here now mm. and ultimately we're looking for you know um i mean i, I would you know what we're, we're looking for for remedy we're here um camped in we're all very uh we're getting supplies from all over the place we're getting messages of support from as far away as australia and people have been bringing it, we've got like a harvest festival table in the hallway because people are coming up and bringing us food and and blankets and water and everything else so Guy, yeah, we're in the trenches. Guy, this is all wonderful news, and obviously something very, very important is going on here. We've got serious criminal events, which is property, which is property being stolen from individuals, fraudulent court documents, of course. Um, originally, um, the police were, uh, I'm going to say, well behaved. I was also present when they were trying to, uh, when the bailiffs came for your other property. So the local police were well behaved. They were certainly listening, um, but it seems that since that original attempt to, um, for the bailiffs to take your other property, that the police have started to have a bit of a change of heart. Is that really what's going on, or is this a little bit of a, a lull in the storm? Well, what I think actually, Brian, I, I, to be honest with you, uh, it's the same inspector that was here when 70 of them in a the helicopter carried me off the premise he was the one at my place, which he, and he was, you know, being very affable to, to, towards us. He's engaged in this, but he brought his boss, the chief inspector, yesterday for a, an off-the-record conversation just to basically put the position of what's going on. What, you know, they want to know what's going on, really. And he was, he, he was again, they were both very well, well-mannered to me. And they were saying, we understand what you're saying about these fraudulent documents, and they were questions about it, which is the first time, and they were looking me in the eyes when they were doing it, and they said, do you think the bailiffs 
know that these documents are fraudulent they're using. And I said, we can prove with evidence, if you require it, that it's the bailiffs who are actually using the, making the fraudulent documents in some cases. Mm. And they do... So they've said that they basically don't want to be here because imagine this is a, a, a civil dispute at the very most, it can be called that. And there's a civil dispute to be using a helicopter three times a day and to use a continual 24-hour guard on the gates of the property. It doesn't sound much, much of a civil dispute to me. What I think is happening, I think somewhere inside the police service, in the Freemasonry element of it, the Operation Tiberius types, maybe there's a chief superintendent, and every now and again he's telling the... Uh, certain officers, you know, get the get the helicopter up and go to certain coordinates and just to worry the situation. Um, the actual general police on the ground, the PCs and that, they're all very nice. They know nothing. They they absolutely don't know why they're there. They can't understand why they're there. In fact, they've said uh, they feel like a private security company. Yeah. Um, but, well, but, but uh, and the inspector and the chief inspector have been very good to me, but I do feel there's obviously an element in there that's keep trying to keep the pressure on us with all these... Um, Guards and with the with the helicopter in particular, because it's you know it's a particular sort of nuisance buzzing around. It, it, are the police there? Sorry, stuttering a bit. The police there is a guard on you, or are they there uh, to keep the police because they could anticipate a heavy mob of bailiffs coming back? I, I wish I knew, and in fact they they intimated yesterday to somebody who was down at the gate talking to them because we've offered them cups of tea and stuff. They they were here to protect us from anyone else coming back and creating a breach of the peace at this moment. Um, I've given the police uh, quite a serious file. A, a, a guy came up from Southampton, packed his house into his van and moved up here to help me on Saturday, which is wonderful of him. And he brought a printer up. So I was fortunate enough to be able to give them fraudulent court documents that have been issued in various matters, not just this one, but on other documents, just to establish that this, the culture is not in there. And um, so they got a pile of documents and they said they were going to their legal team with them because they didn't particularly want to be here. So we're waiting, we're awaiting the results of the legal team's examination of our documentation. So that's where that is, Brian. Right. Can I just ask, um, what, what about the guy who um, supposedly bought the property at auction, Guy? Do you know where he is? Have there been any correspondence between him and uh, the police and yourselves? Well, when I heard that there was somebody who had bought the property, of course I was shocked. So I, uh, I immediately sent my son up, and we, and we took a land registry document that was on the uh, 15th of June that had my name on it. So, you know, and, and we came up, and my son came up and said, you know, my, my father's away, but what are you doing on the property? And the guy called the police straight away, and, um, which is no need for it, because we're basically saying to him, you know, hang on, mate, you know, it's not your property, and, you, you, you know, if you're, are you a victim of this? But he called the police and they, they examined the land registry document and said, oh, yes, but of course, transfers can take several weeks. I said, yeah, but we don't transfer it because we've not sold it. So is there someone claiming to have a power of attorney and do this for me without informing me? Or what's the situation? So the guy, um, I then sent him a, 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 a notice, which I had filed with Hereford County Court. And I filed it with them for any future reference. And I, I did that on the uh, 10th of June and saying to contact me in five days because we need to talk to him about the ownership of the property that he's an incumbent at. He never contacted us. In fact, he called the police again, and the police contacted me again and tried to say that I was harassing the guy. And I then said to them, listen, this is a private matter, and as far as I'm concerned, if you want to engage in private contractual matters with me, then you, you'd better seek legal advice, I said to the police at that time, and I served a notice on them. Well, then, since then, I've came, come back, and I've reaped the property. Yeah. So it, it's all very... It's all very up in the air, but, but there, there are battle lines being drawn, and so we all know where we are with it all. Um, I'm hoping that they get back to me, and after the examination, if the legal team can either say... I mean, what's the guy's option, right? He's either an innocent victim, which I'm starting to suspect he probably isn't, because how much did they buy the property for, property for allegedly? I, I have no idea. So I strongly suspect that he's in, in some sort of Freemasonry angle, and I, I, that's why I won't mention his name, but because... Um, it's a very odd situation, a situation with some of the neighbours who, who now seem to be of a different mindset. And some, one of them was a tenant of ours for seven years, and we never even fell out, never even put their rent up. And I, I'm, I'm thinking that there is some sort of undercurrent that's going on behind all this. And, of course, if these Freemasonry elements are able to buy up properties, get gifted properties very, very cheap, and mm -hmm. set up their new empires around the United States, this is what's happening on an industrial scale, right? You know, and I think everybody's properties are getting ripped from under them. 
on fraudulent documents, and that's why we've been advising everybody to, you know, give us their, their court documents in forensic examination on them if necessary and tell them in 10 minutes if they're, if they're correct. Right. Uh, a couple of people asking, Guy, w was there any um, mortgage associated with Bodnam Manor? I don't know whether you're... No, 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 no. So my father bought the property for cash in 18, 1985. Right. And right. There was no mortgage whatsoever. Right. OK. Um, you've got quite a few people up there supporting you. And I know there have been various groups set up. I know um, there's a, a Facebook group called Response, who are also involved with the Home Eviction Lawful Prevention um, and, and obviously, you know, the Response group, they are one together. Um, have, are these guys up there helping you? And, um, oh, and what, oh, oh, yes. Yeah, on, on Saturday, I mean, Salon from to Get Out of Debt Free and AD from Response. Uh, AD is a, a response team, so it's for, and it's got, now gone on, it's, it's every, every sort of regional area is now tending to get a, a regional response together and in the last week they've stopped 11 evictions and they're fully supportive and they came up here and in fact the, some of the guys have been back two or three times bringing me supplies you know and i, I know i've got I, i'm so grateful to people for traveling from all over the country to um support us and bring us supplies and as we try to be so transparent with our stuff um you know the court and public opinion has already made a decision in our matter uh, we feel and yes i mean the, the response Teams, uh, fantastic, and uh, you know, if anybody wants to check them out, someone else has done that. Something connected to that called Help. Um, but if you go and check out, if you find your regional response un unit and contact them if anyone's got an eviction going on, and these guys will come around and will help you in all ways. And again, again, we're asking ultimately for people that people will support people, but. We, we want paperwork off these bailiffs because we want to examine it. So if anyone's getting evicted, they better have the correct paperwork, else they're, they're, they're laying themselves open to getting arrested. Right. Well, um, thank you, Guy, for a tremendous update. And it's very nice to have some positive news. Um, wonderful to see that people across the country are now starting to step forward to help uh, their friends and help their neighbours. This is the way it should be. And of course, ultimately, it's peaceful people power that's going exactly. to overturn this regime. So we'll say thank yeah. you very much for that report. Obviously, if anything changes in the next couple of days, uh, Guy, let, let us know and we'll get you back on to give a public update. Wonderful. Th thank you both. Thank you all for giving us a platform. Thank Cheers, you very much. Guy. Take care, hon. Bye. Bye. Okay. Well, there you have it. And of course, we could not be uh, broadcasting this information if we still didn't have access to the Internet. But I think you've been picking up, Mike, on uh, a little bit of control planned for uh, Google at least. Uh, well, this is the BBC uh, complaining um, bitterly um, that uh, 12 uh, of their news stories have been removed from Google's search. Uh, rankings as a result of this uh, so-called right to be forgotten law, which uh, came into force from Europe uh, in May. Uh, and uh, but what I'm interested in here is that really the the stories that have been removed, the 12 stories, are are pretty uh, innocuous. Things like uh, a man cleared of a stabbing in London in 2010, uh, the jailing of a former Daily Mail employee who threatened to hack the newspaper in 2000. Uh, a 2009 diary entry from the BBC's then Jerusalem correspondent Tim Franks on the merits of humus, uh, and uh, and so on. It's it's stuff which doesn't seem uh, that serious. Um, so so what's going on? I think really what they're what they're going to do is to to remove uh, a, a significant number of really pretty uh, gentle stories, and in in among that lot. So you get people distracted with all this nonsense and in, in among that lot, you'll probably find that there's some significant stuff. But I mean, I think I think the, the real issue here is is just uh, it highlights once again what a monopoly Google has become. And of course, uh, uh, you know, choosing one of the alternative search engines like DuckDuckGo or some of these other ones, that might do something to protect privacy a little, but it isn't going to do anything to actually produce uh, better quality search results because those are all based on Google's database in the first place. They say Start Page is very good, don't yes, they? Yes, but Start Page is another one which uses Google. Oh, is it? So it just okay. all they're doing is providing a front end to Google and stripping out 
um, the, uh, the the privacy issues they say right. um, so you know at the end of the day Google is pretty much a monopoly yeah uh, and uh, but you know what one of the other interesting aspects of this is that of course this censorship only applies uh, within the European Union because it's a European directive uh, and so if you're searching the internet from the United States you get a different set of results uh, and of course uh, under those circumstances you say well a very uh, half decent way to to solve this problem is uh, to use a VPN or a proxy server that's that's sitting in one of the other countries around the world which doesn't experience the same type of censorship um, and uh, and this is the one that I would choose uh, we should say for the sake of following Ofcom's rules of course uh, <laughs> that others other VPNs are available <laughs> but I, I choose I choose called? they're called Mulvad and they're they're uh, Swedish I believe uh, the reason that there there may be one or two others that do something similar, but the reason that I like this particular organisation is because um, all you need to do in order to to get service from them is to provide uh, you know a sort of let's say a fifteen digit number which would be a unique identifier and put uh, five euros in an envelope and send it to them and within a couple of days you'll have uh, a totally anonymised um, VPN connection without even needing to have a PayPal account or a Bitcoin account or any kind of other account which might identify you. And of course, it's not quite as simple as that. There's other things you need to do in order to be totally anonymous on the internet. But, but I still I like this. I like this little organisation because because of their attitude to this sort of thing. But the, the reason I mention a VPN, of course, is because they have servers in other countries. So if you want to do a Google search as if you're doing a Google search in the United States, you just uh, select a particular uh, country that you want to appear on the internet from, and away you go. So. That may be a way to get around uh, the latest uh, European Union censorship of search results, um, assuming that you accept anything that uh, Google returns to you anyway. But there you go. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're going to move on pretty quickly. Uh, An awful lot happening out there, most of it important. So we'll try and bring uh, people up to date with what we see as the most uh, important of the topics. Um, the military and David Cameron. Yeah, former army head Lord Dannett has called for Parliament to be recalled over the ongoing crisis in Iraq. David Cameron last week uh, ruled out full deployment of troops to Iraq, but is thinking about arming the Kurds. Um, But Lord Dannett believes a full debate is needed in Parliament, but it seems Cameron is too busy on the beach. Until today, that is, but we'll get to that. I'd just like to have show people Cameron's holiday snaps courtesy of the Daily Mail. Could almost have the fish and chips on the table proving that he's he's really one of us. Um, uh, Viewers of a weak disposition (laughs) should uh, turn away now. Uh, Here we are. Um, Some form of mini tsunami (laughs) went up the channel uh, when David Cameron took his first dip in the ocean. (laughs) Uh, but clearly he's been doing a lot of sitting and eating and drinking and not a lot of thinking. And this is what happens to your body. It's uh, pretty worrying. And of course, uh, a whole a whole number of different holiday venues that yeah, you picked up. Yeah, in the last up. four years, Lanzarote, the Algarve, Grenada, Ibiza, Mallorca, Tuscany and uh, Cornwall and uh, Scotland but as he's, well. He's so just an ordinary guy, worried ordinary about guy. having his house repossessed, worried about the uh, interest rate on his mortgage, uh, worried about how he's going to spend all his money. Mm. What are these people really doing? Well, it gets a bit more serious than that. We just want to remind people that these men uh, and women, but we're going to stick with this selection, are the people who have been working to create wars and violence around the world. So whether it's Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Gaza or the Ukraine, these are the people that think uh, the British military should be out there throwing munitions around. And remember, of course, that they are able to create money for this violence, but there's no money for the NHS, schools, elderly, roads, child abuse victims. So at the end of the day, it's not the government that's doing anything. It's always individuals. And uh, we're going to take a leaf out of Saul Alinsky's book, Rule for Radicals, Rules for Radicals, where he says, of course, concentrate on the actual individuals, concentrate your attention on real people. Uh, not on institutions and organisational names. So we're going to do that. We've shown you some of these people. If you want to know why Britain's in a state, it's because we've got some despicable people running the country. 
And the trouble's growing, so uh, this was kindly sent through to us by an ex-forces uh, person. Uh, so we've got an ex-SAS officer warning that the army could be seen on the UK streets if British jihadists return from war. Um, we're not convinced by this article in the Express because we don't think the analysis goes deep enough. Uh, but who is actually causing the problems giving rise to the jihadist movement? Who are these people that uh, supposedly want to kill us all? And um, the other small point in this is we virtually haven't got an army left. So it's going to be interesting to see how the army can be operating overseas and appearing on British streets. Uh, we're rather of the opinion that the army on British streets will actually be part of the European army. So unless we get this mess sorted out, yeah. I think we should brace ourselves to see the French, uh, Polish, or perhaps even the Germans uh, uh, keeping law and order on British streets. Uh, we're just, uh, sorry, I'll just uh, scroll back here. Uh, where are we? There we are. We just bring this back on screen, if we may. On the left of your picture, uh, this is part of a tweet um, where the Daily Mail is pushing out this article. Um, my personal feeling, I know others here may disagree with me, but my personal feeling is uh, what we've got is the Express helping to wind up the fear factor in the British public so that we can concentrate on these uh, terrorists and not look at the domestic terrorists running Westminster. Mm. But you've got something uh, pretty shocking, I think, to follow this, Mike. Uh, well, yes, as, as Lou said, uh, David Cameron has been away on holiday, but he came back today for a meeting uh, over the beheading of uh, this journalist, uh, 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 sorry, James Foley, who's an American journalist. Um, and uh, right on cue, the usual suspects were out tweeting this morning, if true, the murder of James Foley is shocking and depraved, uh, I will today chair meetings on the situation in Iraq and Syria and Sajid Javid of course uh, straight out as well um, and uh, well so what has happened well apparently uh, apparently a British jihadist uh, operating in uh, the Middle East um, has decided to behead uh, this journalist who was originally uh, captured in 2012 um, I have to say if if you watch the video and if you do watch the video of this I, I strongly uh, suggest uh, you know take some uh, thought about whether you're going to watch it or not. Mm -hmm. It is available in various places. Um, but uh, James Foley, if that is James Foley, was very calm and collected as he as he knelt down and made a speech about um, how um, the US was doing the wrong thing in the Middle East, um, and then calmly uh, sat by as the uh, allegedly British person in the black suit there uh, attacked him with a a, a sharp blade. Um, I mean, various people that we've spoken to today um, are highly suspicious of this video. Uh, I'm pretty suspicious of the video. And it's quite interesting that when you look at the mainstream media coverage of this, um, there's very, it's very guarded language. It apparently shows this. It might show that. If true, this, per this, this killing is shocking. So at the moment, it's, it's very uh, uh, guarded uh, and unclear as to, as to whether there is any truth in this. Um, but, uh, uh, sorry, what was I going to finish this off with? Well, basically, uh, we're going to leave it at that. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm highly suspicious about whether this is whether there's any truth in this in this story at all at this point in time. He looks I mean, he's been kept in. He's been kept by them um, prisoner for two years. He looks kind of well cared for and um, not hungry and shaven and uh, yes indeed uh, there, there's lots of very and he's very calm I mean uh, I, I have to say the video the, the video, video was quite professional yes but the, the video was very professionally yeah. produced um, and uh, I suppose it, it, it is easier these easier than ever these days to produce this type of video uh, professionally I think people need to you know if they can stomach it and it, do watch it with care and make sure there aren't children um, around but um, I think people need to take a, uh, a look at the video themselves and then come up decide with their own and decide different. themselves and uh, maybe just email us in and let us know, you know your thoughts on it. That'd yeah. be good. Well, we just follow on from there with the fact that uh, we've been pushing quite hard over the last year for the fact of what is the relationship between Britain's politicians and Israel. 
Uh, we've pointed out the fact that Conservative Friends of Israel boast that it has influence over 82% of the Tory MPs. Uh, the other parties are much the same. Uh, but this was an interesting article from a few days ago in The Telegraph, When Did Britain Lose Faith in Israel? Uh, written by a gentleman called Benny Morris. Um, it talked through the problems uh, with the Palestinians. Uh, this is a part of the article here. The Palestinians have been treated badly, but Britain, America, fellow Arab Zionists are all to blame. Uh, it all sounds good. Big attack on Nick Clegg, because apparently he... he uh, uh, has said that Britain should suspend arms sales to Israel. When you go on through the ar article, it gives a very um, heavy-handed message in support of Israel. But what we wanted to really show was that the uh, Telegraph, we feel, being disingenuous, because this is, uh, this is the man, Professor Morris, author of One State, Two States, resolving the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, and if you have a look at his background, I've just chosen Wikipedia here, but there's a lot of information. Israeli historian, and he's working at the Ben Gurion University uh, in Israel. So we've got a man who is uh, a declared Zionist. He's working through one of the Israeli uh, educational establishments. Uh, he's writing in the British Telegraph just under his name. But obviously this man, as a minimum, has a large number of vested interests. Uh, why would the Telegraph be disingenuous with readers and not fully declare who this man is? And uh, we'll just give the reminder about that. Please visit Conservative Friends of Israel website where you will see uh, the boasts being made of how strong David Cameron's support is for Israel. He reiterates his staunch support of Israel's right to self-defense. So this is the British Prime Minister. Supposedly his number one allegiance is to Britain. Uh, but according to Mr. Cameron and Conservative Friends of Israel, his uh, number one allegiance is to Israel. It is unshakable. Mm. Uh, we just simply say, how is this possible to have a prime minister who effectively has a foot in two camps? But they all, they, they all have, all part, across the parties, they've all got, the, the Lib Dems have got it, the, I think it's even um, UKIP have it as well, That's and true. Labour, friends of Israel. So they're all involved. And I mean, I, I was stunned when I found the UKIP one, Friends of Israel, and well, supporting Israel. Well, we, we would say as a minimum, what, what would the situation be if we had 82% of our Conservative MPs who were Friends of Germany or Friends of Italy? The or same. Friends of Palestine, so, even. There was a picture out today on Facebook, actually, of all the, all the leaders who, who were wearing the skull cap and, and going and visiting out there, all, you know, heads of state, yeah. etc. And said, would any of these wear, wear, a, wear a Palestinian scarf? Could you see any of them in there? Probably not. No. And uh, on the subject of Conservative Friends of Israel, it seems appropriate we should bring this gentleman up. Uh, yeah, although this is a completely different subject, um, because this is about uh, the BS, the big society, and uh, uh, 15,000 extra places for youth groups across the UK, according to Brooks Newmark. Of course, he is, he is the new head of, of uh, uh, the, the government's big society sort of initiative. Um, and, uh, and I, of course, it's absolutely great that there's 15,000 extra places for youth groups across the UK. Uh, but he thinks that this is great because it's being funded by money taken from banks as a result of fraud and corruption. So it's OK that the fraud and the corruption happened. And it's OK that the fraud and corruption money that's been taken from the banks is going to, to a good cause. It's OK that the fraud happened as a, you know, because that's what's happened at the end of the day. Brooks Newmark, let's get some prosecutions for some of these people that committed the fraud in the first place. And instead of using fraudulently gained money in order to fund your big society, how about we actually use the Bradbury Pound to uh, develop some productive capability in this company in this country and some proper apprenticeships uh, maybe that might be a pro better move forward than taking fraudulent money from fraudulent banks to fund your fraudulent big society yeah well said mike and louise picked up on uh, this article which really goes nicely hand in hand uh back on big society yeah he um just very briefly it's really just mirroring what mike said um the uh, money went to the big lottery fund um they put it into a uh, a little charity that didn't deliver. They asked for the money back. The money had already been spent and it's all around the big society and the fraud. So and very close to David Cameron. Very, so very close to David Cameron, this. Yeah. If you're still not fully aware of the big society, do have a look at the back issues, the UK column, where we've done a lot of research into what big society really is, the onset of communitarianism. 
um, and remember that the Guardian newspaper via its online setup um, is a very big supporter of the networks driving both big society and also training young people using public money to be community activists and change agents in line with David Cameron's declared Saul Alinsky policy. So this is not just about a bit of money from the banks. This is about uh, corrupt money from the banks being used to drive massive constitutional change mm. in Britain if we allow it. Meanwhile, sex offending uh, on the increase. Indeed it is. Prince Philip's aide, um, ex-Royal Marine Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Herman, uh, aged 79, worked for Philip between 71 and 74, um, is due to appear in court next week, charged with sexually assaulting a 12-year-old whilst employed by Prince Philip. That's all we've got on at the moment, but and we will keep you updated. Remarkable, 42 years ago, and yet yep. enough evidence can be found to bring this one forward. We're going to, a uh, little bit later, touch on uh, Cliff Richard. Uh, well, we've, we've got some questions on that. Uh, but let's uh, bring this lady on screen. This is um, Melanie Shaw, the whistleblower and abuse victim from Beechwood Homes. Um, we, we just want to report facts which we believe should be in the public domain. Uh, we now know that Melanie Shaw did not have a solicitor uh, with her when she was in court and subsequently remanded at HM Prison Peterborough, which is run by the private company Sodexo. Uh, she's been denied medication and medical treatment. She's been strip searched three times. She's been bullied by inmate mates and prison staff. Nottingham City and County Council refused to say what measures they put in place to investigate Beechwood abuses and protect children. They will not say if a serious case review panel has been started. Nottingham Police have clearly failed to fully investigate the Beechwood abuses and the alleged deaths at Beechwood Children's Home. Uh, there's a number of the uh, victims that are, are saying quite openly now over social networks that the police have effectively failed to investigate. They've lost dec documents and some of them are saying the police are simply lying. Uh, the Crown Prosecution Service, very jittery. Um, they're refusing to explain why Melanie was imprisoned with no evidence presented in court. And it's being reported in some quarters that Melanie is now being locked up for 23 and a half hours each day, leaving her just 30 minutes for showering, making calls and organising her defence. And remember, of course, this lady is on remand. She's not been found guilty of anything, but she's locked up in a cell, no TV or radio that we know of, for 23 and a half hours a day. Does she have any books? Uh, we don't even know about that at the moment, Mike. And of course, um, uh, other former child abuse victims are saying to us that this is, this is incredible pressure on her mind. She is a vulnerable woman as a result of what she's been through. And many people are saying that the actions of Sodexo's HM Prison Peterborough clearly seemed aimed to help uh, try and destabilise mm. uh, Melanie. Why yeah. would you do that? presumably to stop her telling the truth about what she knows. So, so maybe so maybe people should be contacting Sodexo and asking what's going on there? Well, I, th I think this is a very good uh, way to go. Crown Prosecution Service um, got very jittery with us this morning. They don't really want to talk to us. Uh, Sodexo, huge company, boasts of the tens of thousands of workers, uh, but you can easily contact uh, the British uh, HQ through the internet and uh, speak to the lovely lady in charge. Somebody just asked exactly what I was about to ask. Can um, can people send in books, or should we maybe give the give uh, Sodexo a call to say our book's going to be accepted? Uh, I Central think the correct there? procedure is to ask the prison, but we warn you that you'll find it very, very difficult to get through, as we now know from prison staff themselves uh, that there's been cuts in the um, uh, telephone uh, staff, there's telephone manning, uh, and so a lot of the time it will simply continue to ring or go through the automated system. Uh, this is progress through the Home Office and David Cameron's public finance initiative of uh, privatisation of prisons. So contrast uh, Melanie, locked up for uh, uh, two and a half hours a day. 23 and a half. 20, sorry, 23 and a half hours a day. Apologies for that. Uh, with this man, um, we talked about this Monday, but Rolf Harris 
Land's cushy gardening job at prison just weeks after conviction. So here's the man who's committed the offence. He's put in a softer prison than Melanie Shaw, the victim. Uh, it's quite easy to see what's going on here, isn't it? Um, David Cameron, Theresa May clearly protecting the paedophiles. They get the soft option. Meanwhile, the victims are uh, treated despicably. And of course, the same thing is going on north of the border. Robert Greene in prison twice, and he's now on his 92nd day of house arrest, not as a result of a court procedure as such. He still doesn't know the charges, but a whim by Alex Salmon's junta. Has he been able to use the internet? No, he's still Recently. not. He's, he's still not allowed to go on the internet, no. Uh, has he abused any children? No. What's he been trying to do? Protect them. So obviously locked up in prison or his house as soon as possible. So if you'd like to challenge the Crown Prosecution Service yourself, you may like to visit their website. Uh, you can go through to Nottingham as a local area. But we were very impressed to see on their website that they're boasting that some of the members of the East Midlands Rape and Serious Sexual Offences team also work out of the Northern Office. So remarkable that we have uh, a rape and abuse victim locked up in a high security prison in her cell for 23 and a half hours. Here's the Crown Prosecution Service boasting they help victims. <laughs> But today they told us, um, they were really quite forceful about this, that the Crown Prosecution Service only communicate with approved and properly regulated press and media. Uh, but they did appear very nervous that members of the public had expressed concerns over the conduct of the 25th of June court case in which the public present reported no evidence uh, presented and bundles being handed to the judge after the hearing had been formally closed. Uh, so we just make the comment there that public hearings are held so that the public can actually see justice being done. Did child abuse victim Melanie Shaw receive justice? Uh, perhaps uh, you'd like to ask that question of Is, Crown Prosecution did Service. Did you speak to the same woman as you spoke to yesterday who was getting rather agitated? Well, that you? was the Home Office. Oh, the home I office, think we, right. we might have to uh, comment on the Home Office one further, but we simply asked the Home Office if Theresa May had appointed a head of the That's child right. abuse inquiry, uh, but she will do shortly, uh, presumably when she's back from holidays. So, sorry, just before we move on, Brian, just to clarify that point again, the CPS will not speak to us because we're not an approved and regulated media outlet. And therefore, basically, what they seem to be saying is that they're discriminating against community newspapers, community media, um, that's on one point, but the other point is their main concern is that they can't really control what we say. Uh, well, that's, that's absolutely uh, what, what was said, and I asked for the gentleman to provide me uh, with that statement in writing. So I asked that he provided me with their own rules as to how they deal with the press and media. Of course, I haven't had an email back yet. Would, um, would we have got more correspondence if we'd signed up with Atvod? No. Uh, no. Not relevant to this particular Isn't it? No. Oh, no. Okay. But we get, we get the impression, if, if of course you're out there, UK column now been running for whatever it is, 10 years, uh, well over uh, 1.2 million copies gone worldwide, daily broadcast. Two years But now. We're, not, we're not really in the club, so oh. they're not going to talk to us. Uh, north of the border, well, the truth's coming up to the surface. So Scottish Express reporting on Tam Patton here. This is all linked back to the abuse of a former member of the Bay City Rollers. Encourage you to go and look at this. Uh, but basically, once again, um, the victim is saying that there were parties where young boys were being abused at Mr Patton's house. Other high society people were there, including police officers. Uh, but the police have subsequently done nothing to investigate. So Robert Green, of course, has been talking about this sort of thing. Uh, Robert Green mentioned uh, uh, or alleged activities behind the closed doors of the Violate Club, uh, and uh, subsequently he was arrested. Meanwhile, here's the main man, um, Kenny McCaskill, and um, he's made the front page of the Scottish Express because he's refused to... Uh, uh, to keep a pledge to sit down and hear what abuse uh, survivors have to say. 
Uh, unfortunately, the text is a little bit grayed out there. Uh, but what we'd highlighted was survivors were talking about um, graves of children at some of the children's homes in Scotland uh, where there's a gravestone but no name. Uh, in my book, that means that there's an unknown body which should result in a police investigation for possible murder. Uh, but of course, uh, Police Scotland, if you don't investigate, there is no crime. No. So here's the lady um, we're interested in. Um, she's looking a little bit haggard these days. So, uh, yeah, discretion when viewing. Um, we simply asked her, had she appointed, uh, or we asked the Home Office, had she appointed a chairperson for the investigation into child abuse? Um, was she indeed in her office or was she on holiday? They couldn't say whether she was on holiday because that was a security risk. They did say the inquiry was running. We said, well, it doesn't seem to have a chairman. When will they be a chairman? And the media team said shortly. So we said, does that mean next week or next month or next year? And they said, we can't tell you. So uh, no problems there. Uh -huh. I won't bring the text up on this mic because uh, there's a little bit of an issue. But let's um, bring in, in our friend Saul Alinsky again, because of course it isn't the Home Office that makes decisions, it's these people that are responsible for what's going on. So if any of our audience are feeling pretty annoyed about what we're showing, um, these are the people you should be contacting. Of course, Teresa looking a little bit, I think she's had some form of passion fruit scrub there. She's looking very good in that it's picture. But if you're feeling annoyed, these are the people that you should be asking the questions when they get back from their holidays. And if you doubt what Theresa May is really up to, well, here is something particularly vicious uh, because she's coming up with a new law, which means it's going to be very, very interested for men to be jailed for domestic abuse, even when no physical abuse has taken place. Um, here she is. And um, this is what she's talking about. Uh, the law will make the worst cases of non-violent controlling behaviour a jailable offence. And if you deny your partner money, the partner can have you presumably put in jail. What's this about destroying families? Family life, yeah. So, so this is this is sorry, the Mike. yeah sorry this is the extension of or this is the first signs of every policy uh, being assessed on its impact on the family then. Yeah, yeah, the impact to be assessed is how well is the policy destroying our families. And we just finish off on that, this particular section with reminding people that Beechwood uh, uh, abuse victim Mickey Summers doing great work. And this is part of his Facebook where he's really uh, bringing the truth out and he's challenging Nottingham police to meet with him to discuss uh, why they haven't acted on his evidence, why statements have disappeared, mm. why they are not doing their job. There can only be one answer because Nottingham police are complicit in the cover-up of the massive abuse in Nottingham. And, uh, well, well, what's Nick Clegg been up to? Well, not so much Nick Clegg, but um, the, generally the Lib Dems. Uh, disgraced Lib Dem, uh, Lord Renard, has had his suspension lifted by the Lib Democrats um, after allegations of pestering 10 women were dropped. Um, but he was criticised heavily by not taking Alistair Webster QC's recommendation of apologising to the women. Finally, in May, he put out a statement apologising sincerely, sincerely for inadvertently encroaching upon personal space of his accusers and so, um, what's that phrase again the fr exact phrase he sincerely apologized inadvertently encroaching upon personal space right i must be very careful because we sit in quite close proximity yes. here but Watch that's it. this is the new language if you've done something wrong but you want to, well you know let's uh let's tuck it under the carpet, just change the language so that it all sounds okay. Exactly, and the thumb, the pe somebody just put pestering, but yes, those are the words that are being reported. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but Nick Clegg did say that the Liberal Democrat Party has changed since... Yes, he did, exactly, yes. yes. Well, they We're have, getting to that. But they have changed because they've now changed the rules to make it easier to invade people's uh, personal space. Yes, this is true. But we're Get okay away. at the moment. So here we are, The Guardian really telling us what it's about. Uh, David Cameron also uh, crowing that, of course, he's done a great job in helping the now 500,000 troubled families. Uh, if you want to read some 
pretty unpleasant stuff. This is Cameron boasting that he's helping families uh, when, of course, what he's actually doing is raising the number of troubled families so that he exactly. can break apart family life. And uh, what better man to assist than um, uh, Eric the Pickles? Yeah. A um, Go pardon? On. Go on. Well, I'd just like to remind people, this is the man who, who said that uh, council shouldn't use political charity common purpose, itself linked to child abuse, of course. Um, meanwhile, David Cameron was in India promoting it. Yeah. But he's going to help them turn their lives around. Yeah. So have a look at this yourselves. Yeah, he's wanting, um, he's wanting to include under fives uh, from struggling homes. Physical and mental health um, people as well will also be at the front of the new push for this troubled families department. And uh, 110,000 uh, apparently families have been helped. And uh, here she is. Here is the woman heading it up. There she is, little beauty. Louise Casey, and she's head of the programme. And uh, she's been um, out there talking to troubled families, apparently. She, she looks like she's got uh, she's a, 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 a host of empathy there. Yeah. Yeah. I think yes. my kids would run a mile if they bumped into that. Well, we'll leave her there, I think. And, um, of course, what's uh, now hitting the headlines, uh, but it's this man, Sir Cliff Richard. And uh, we're just fascinated by the reports over this. And we'd like, uh, uh, well, we'd like to be saying we think it needs a lot more thought than, than uh, just looking at what the uh, mainstream. mainstream press is producing. Yeah. So what what is, have you got? So the 14th of this month, the mainstream broke... Um, what the alternative media has been chatting about for years, Cliff Richard's involvement with children and links to Elm Guesthouse. So we first heard of a police raid on his home in Berkshire last Thursday. South Yorkshire police were given a warrant to search Sir Cliff's property in Sunningdale in Berkshire after allegations were made of a sexual nature with a boy under 16, I think they said he was 12 actually, uh, back in the 1980s. Now, um, here we go, and we've got loads of support. He's got now we've got Max Clifford's lawyer, who was in talks with him for five hours apparently yesterday. He's in there, and he's been speaking to um, to to the lawyers of Max Clifford. And um, this is where you're saying you're not certain whether this one. Yeah, we well this you know across social media there was um, there were whispers going around that this story back in February was possibly Cliff Richard but I'm certain there was a 12 year old boy in the first article and then, now they're saying this is a 10 year old boy is it the same person is it the same child they're also saying in the other report that it was not involved with Savile but it is the Fernbridge and um, Elm so Tree so it's very interesting here. We, we've got the mainstream media being very careful. They don't yeah. report quite rightly, we're going to say, on people until the fact, facts are, are known. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, in this incident, the BBC is suddenly brought in straight away at the case. Well, what happened with the BBC is the BBC knew about something going on. They went to South Yorkshire Police a few weeks ago and wanted to wanted to run the story and that according to the newspapers and the mainstream and South Yorkshire Police South Yorkshire Police said no we will give you the you know you we will give you um, a heads up when the sting's going to be so then that is why now we've had the BBC being under the MPs apparently going to be um, calling the BBC in and South Yorkshire Police to find out why all this was done on Cliff Richards so, so is this just to get the case dropped now. Now that's what's in my mind. Are they trying to get the case? Or the BBC involved? That's just full of paedophiles. So the BBC yeah. can't investigate paedophiles in the BBC itself, but we bring them in to yeah. report on Cliff Richard. Now let's go straight down the middle of the road and say, isn't it fascinating that in this high-profile case, a lot of people coming out in support of Cliff Richard, the BBC itself, a paedophile organisation, mm -hmm. gets the tip off. Uh, to print the story. Yeah. Um, we're just going to remind people about other things that uh, seem to have strange connections. So this yeah. article from The Express talking about Jewel Dando. Yeah, and, and do you know what? Barry George didn't get a penny compensation, even though it's proven that he was, you know, he went under all that um, harassment, put in prison, and he wasn't entitled to any any compensation mm. at all. Well, they're probably doing a Melanie Shaw on him. Yeah, so here was Jill Dando and this article saying that she tried to alert her bosses to a paedophile ring at the BBC involving big name stars. Uh, so we never did get to the bottom of that one. And uh, we just 
you know, what did this lady know? What would she say? Okay. Um, what is the truth about Cliff Richard at the moment? Um, whatever happens to him, it's got to be fair trial. It's got to be a proper investigation. It's got to be a fair trial. If we don't have proper investigations and fair trial, we've got no justice. Mm. So um, we need the facts, but why was the BBC brought in? And um, this one is very interesting, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's, well it's, it's, all, it's all done and dusted then, isn't it? If Silla's turned around and said, I'm positive the allegations are without foundation, that's it, case closed, Silla's spoken. How does she know? We don't. So we, we will report on this as the information comes out, but UK Column is saying something dirty happened, which appears to be a direct spoiler of the police investigation into Cliff Richard. There are videos around on the internet with a diary of and the signing in book at Elm Guest House. And I do believe the name Kitty was up on there as well. It's worth just going and having a look. Okay. Well, I'm going to jump a little bit here to you, Mike, and you've got a, a bit of a comment about fracking. Uh, well, this is something that has appeared in the mainstream press in uh, the United States. It's a report uh, from an or organization called, uh, um, sorry, just, just lost it for a second there, the, sorry, the Environmental Integrity Project, uh, and they found that between 2010 and 2014, 350 wells, fracking wells in the, in the United States, uh, fracked by 33 different companies, um, were using diesel fuel within the fracking fluid uh, without a permit. This is actually unlawful. Uh, and, uh, and the point that's really being made here uh, in the in the UK is that of course um, the point that's being made in the UK of course is that uh, uh, this is going to be the best regulated regime in the world uh, and the point that I want just want to make here is that this uh, industry in the United States as in the United Kingdom at the, at, at the moment is self-regulated uh, self-reporting self-policing uh, and uh, there, there is no real oversight on their activities. So if they're quite happy to break the rules in this way in the United States over an extended period of time. Now, to, to give a bit of the other side of the story, they claim that the definition of diesel has been changed. Uh, and that, uh, and in fact, uh, that some of the cases that this organization is highlighting, uh, that, that, that the uh, cases are not appropriate because the definition of diesel was different uh, at that time. Um, I think that's a load of nonsense. The fact of the matter is, uh, they were. Uh, that, that's just my opinion. The fact of the matter is, they were. They were still using this type of these type of chemicals, which the diesel. The chemicals that diesel oil contains uh, disperse very well in the water table, uh, and that's why it was uh, it was banned in the United States. So, uh, of course, Halliburton, uh, absolutely one of the companies listed uh, in that, uh, and. Uh, but we, we, we wait with bated breath to see what happens in this country. But uh, more, more evidence of uh, the rhetorical question, they wouldn't do that, would they? No. Mm. Mm. I just want to know, what's the difference between the diesel in Ireland and the diesel over here? I know people can get in a lot of trouble, can't they, if they're using the... Is it red diesel no, in this country bringing it over? No. Red is the agricultural diesel. Oh, right. Okay. As far as yeah. I know, it's, I know. it's got a colour additive in it. Yeah. Oh, right, OK. Somebody's nodding wisely in the studio, so I got that one right. So agricultural diesel with a lower tax is red to right. stop you putting uh, it in your right. motor car. OK. Um, we're going to end with uh, really um, a very strong advert for people to go to www.humanityinmedicine.co.uk and to download the story about Helena Bai. Uh, this was a little girl who died after being treated with the drug Epilim, uh, but um, the most horrific and incredible events took place around her death and her mum and dad... Um, Joan Derrick Boy have been fighting over many, many years now to alert the public to the terrible events within the NHS and the continuing danger of big pharma and drugs, particularly drugs tested on children. So I encourage you to go and download the ebook. Uh, we have an interview with uh, Derek Boy, which we will uh, show um, in fairly shortly. We've got some more information to add around that concerning the NHS, but do go and have a look at that ebook. Uh, it's the UK Column Monthly Meetup tonight at the George and Plimpton. Everyone, welcome. If you want to come and, uh, are you going tonight? Yes, yeah? we will be there. We'll be there. Um, also, if you haven't got a bumper sticker, UK Column bumper sticker, why not? 
Um, they need to be put out everywhere. We need to we need to get this message out. People need to be watching us and supporting us, so we can do more of this. Yeah, so, excellent. Thank you. Okay, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're just about back in the swing, so stay with us. We'll be back with you one o'clock tomorrow. And remember, response on Facebook. Have a look for them. They're helping guy. Thank okay, you. thank you. Bye bye. bye.